So last week we saw the Lord plant his first church. Okay. It was an exciting time. Even though there was no coffee bar, no friendly ushers, no welcoming restrooms, or even a PA system, not even a building. Okay, just a spirit-energized sermon by Peter speaking to unbelievers in the temple. Onlookers attracted not by professional contemporary music, but by the sound of a rushing wind from heaven with tongues of fire above the heads of a large group of men and women. Followed by God being praised in languages that each member of that congregation can understand because they were from all over the world. Now, some of the worst scoffers present said they thought these guys were completely blitzed. They were drunk. But Peter told them the truth. And notice what I said, the truth. And as he went on with his sermon, he came rather accusatory toward his audience. Basically telling them, you are the one that killed Jesus. You're the one that rejected your king. Okay? And that God had sent them. And there was all these signs all over the place that supported Jesus being the son of God. And he had come to the chosen people. Now, according to modern church wisdom, I'm going to put this in quotes. Those consultants that are hired to oversee church growth would tell you that this kind of sermon in this kind of setting was a formula for failure. Okay? There was nothing welcoming about this sermon. Not at all. For example, most of those presents would probably walk out hearing about how they were responsible for Christ's death. How irresponsible of Peter of talking like that. Okay? And though the wind and the flames and the tongues was a great gimmick... And it did grab everybody's attention. They needed something that would keep the crowd engaged and coming back for more. It's modern wisdom. Fortunately, God doesn't listen to man's wisdom. Okay? And when it comes to growing his church, well, we're going to see exactly what happened. Uh, Turn back to Acts 2. We're going to be starting in verse 37. And we are going to see the response of the crowd and see if the church consultants were indeed correct. Now, as we go to that point, verse 37, we basically summarized what happened, that the Holy Spirit had descended upon the believers who were basically spent the, t- the time from when Jesus ascended to the day of Pentecost to when the Holy Spirit descended. They were either in an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem or they were at the temple. And 10 days after Jesus' ascension, and again, I'm convinced they were probably at the temple because that was where most of of the crowd would be gathering for worship during the festival of Pentecost. At that point, all the believers were here, probably about 120. That's the number we get from Luke here in the book of Acts. All All of a sudden, they heard this rushing wind out of heaven. It would have been wonderful to have heard what it, to have been there, to just to hear it, just to see all these tongues of fire appearing, splitting off and being over every single one of those believers present. And then all of a sudden these guys start singing out praises to the Lord, the, uh, just testifying to the great things that God has done in languages that all the people around understood. Not just Greek, not just Latin, not just Hebrew or Aramaic. We're talking, he listed 15 different ethnic groups who were there and they were hearing their own tongue and understanding what was being said. And this baffled everybody present who was listening. They had never seen anything like this before and what brought them was the sound of the rushing wind. So they hear this rushing wind it's just like, what is that? Let's go find it. They go rushing here, and there's this group of people over to one side. And now they see the flames coming down. They're on their heads. Then they hear the words, and they're saying, what is going on here? And then Peter stands up, and he boldly speaks and explains to them what's going on. This is why this is happening. He refers to the Old Testament prophecies that prophesies the coming of the Spirit of the Lord. And... Not only is he explaining what's happening, he's explaining why it was happening. And we mentioned he was a little rough with them. 
Didn't pull any punches, telling them what went wrong. So now we're going to see their response here in Acts 2, starting in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Stop there. So this sermon was extremely effective. Okay. The people were cut to the heart. Okay. That means that it hit them where it hurt the most. Suddenly, they were very much aware of who they were and what they truly were. And they also realized, oh, man, he's right. We were there when they crucified Jesus. Remember, this is not that long after it happened. Okay, barely over a month. And they're thinking, they're right. We were a part of this. He was our only hope. And they're crying, what what can we do? We're lost. We heard what you say. We accept that. What do we do now? And they addressed not just Peter, but they also addressed everybody else, all the other apostles, because they were all involved. Yeah, Peter was speaking, but it was clear that he was merely one among equals. Okay, the first among equals, as is told later. But Peter was willing to tell them, sure. He answered the question directly. You want to know what to do? Repent. Repent. Think about that. That was the first word John the Baptist used in his ministry. And that was the first word that Jesus used in his earthly ministry. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is is near. Okay. And that is the first thing they hear. Repent of your sins and believe on Jesus Christ. And they would give proof of the sincerity of their repentance and faith by being baptized in the name of Jesus, identifying themselves publicly with the Messiah. Okay? Only by repenting and believing on Christ could they receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which they just saw. They saw it come down. And the promise was both for the Jews and those far off, referring to the Gentiles. Though the time of the Gentiles hadn't come yet. This is right now just for Jews. Now, repentance. Let's just make it clear. I think... In fact, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir on this one. But repentance implies a complete change of heart, beginning with the confession of sin. Now, we've often said this, that repentance is not just agreeing that something is wrong, but it means you stop doing it and you don't encourage anyone else to do it. And when I say stop doing that, it includes in secret. Well, I have this hidden sin that no one knows about. Oh, God knows about it. And the th- funny thing about hidden sins, they have a tendency of coming out in the open in probably the most humiliating times. I think anybody before they became Christians can attest to this. Okay, You thought it was all hidden away and then suddenly, boom, everybody seems to know about it. Why? Because stuff like that does, does not remain secret for long. As it says elsewhere, your sin will find you out. Okay? Simple as that. And so... You basically dissuade others from doing it, and you live basically saying, don't do this anymore. That doesn't mean you don't talk about it, okay? It's a powerful testimony for someone who was released from bondage of any sin. Now, we don't have to go through the list. We all know what they are. And it reaches people who are in the same boat. Wow, he was a drug addict, and look at him now. He's, he has peace. He's not you know, high or anything. I want that. Okay, and it's a battle sometimes, and they, and they'll they'll sit in a person who's battled with it themselves, and God has saved them. They'll sit there and say, "I know it's a battle. I know what you're going through." Okay, but God can save, and I'll be here to help you along the line. Okay, and this point can't be ignored. This importance of repentance and it replies it applies to us as believers today. And you've heard me say this many times, that the world looks at us and can't tell the difference between us and sinners. We are doing something wrong. Okay? Our life must be that witness. And 
Remember that magic word from the beginning of Acts. You are to be witnesses. We are to be witnesses in the same way. Thus, we need to truly repent and make sure the Lord keeps us on the straight and narrow. Now, there's a little point here. I want to pause for a moment. Verse 38, when he talks about you repent and be baptized. Now, many people try to interpret this verse as to say that people must be baptized in order to be saved. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Okay? The Greek word, eis, which is translated for in the phrase for the remissions of sin, can mean on account of or on the basis of. Okay, for example, in, in Matthew, we, in, and earlier on when we looked through Luke, John the Baptist baptized on the basis that people had repented. Okay, so this means that here in verse 38, this should not be used to teach salvation by baptism. Okay, if baptism, if baptism were essential for salvation, okay, then it seems strange that Peter doesn't mention anything more about it in any of his other sermons, as we're going to read in the book of Acts. In fact, the people in the home of Cornelius, we're going to look ahead to Acts 10, received the Holy Spirit before they were baptized by water. Okay? Since believers are commanded to be baptized, it's important that we have a clean conscience by obeying, if we can, but we must not think that baptism is a part of salvation. If that were so, the repentant thief on the cross was lied to by Jesus. You know, he says, Lord, let me be with you, you know, when you attain your kingdom. Jesus responds, to this day, you'll be with me in paradise. That, Keith did, that thief didn't come down off the cross and get baptized. Okay? No, he was said, yeah, you believe on me, you're in. Okay? Anyone who came to Christ on their deathbed, if they came to the Christ on their deathbed, and they never got baptized, that means they didn't get it. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible is very clear. While baptism with water was, expect, was an expected symbol of conversion, a public witness that you, are being, that you are now part of Christ, part of the body of Christ, it is not the means to salvation. Okay, period. All right? So if you've never been baptized... I strongly suggest you do so, but you're still, if something happens to you between now and then, you're still going to be in heaven, okay? But it's one of those things that I strongly suggest anyone should do if you have, is, has not happened, because it is a public admission that, yes, I am, I am the Lord's, okay? So, the ministry now begins. Peter said his sermon People responded positively to it. Let's look at verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, get this, about 3,000 souls were added to them, from 120 to 3,000. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Thus continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In a nutshell, here's the model of the church. So first off, there was teaching. The apostles continued to share the word, and they urged the people to trust Jesus. Simple as that. They looked upon the nation of Israel as a perverse or crooked generation that was under condemnation. And they were. This wasn't just an idle threat. Jesus has already said that at some point in your future, 40 years hence, though he didn't give that year, 
he basically said, there are going to be people who hear this who are going to see this judgment come. And of course, we already know, 40 years later, Rome would come and destroy the city and the temple, and the Jews would be scattered. Okay? History was once again repeating itself for the Jews. During the 40 years in the wilderness, a new generation had saved itself from the older generation that had rebelled. There they were. They had just left Egypt. They just got the law. They had left Sinai. They are basically a month into their journey. They reach the borders at Kadesh Barnea, and God says, okay, go ahead. Here's the land. And all these spies go in. Let's spy it out and take a look. And they come back saying, oh, we can't do it. They're too powerful. We're grasshoppers compared to them. Oh, yeah, it's a great place. It's land flowing with milk and honey. But no, there's no way we're going to defeat these guys. Why did we come here? Let's head back to Egypt, yada, yada, yada. They go on and on about it. And only two of those spies said, no, Lord said to take it. That means we take it. But that whole generation, except for those two spies, Caleb and Joshua, they rebelled. And so they got to wander in the 40, for 40 years in the wilderness until that generation had died. And now God is giving his people another 40 years of grace. Okay, it's already started, and it's actually off to a pretty good start. 3,000 people well repented and believed, and they were saved. And you think about that, 3,000 at the end of a first sermon. And this, I think, answers the question that many have had. Now, I'll be honest, it seems like I've been extremely hard slamming megachurches. Okay, and it's not because I'm jealous, and, it's, and I don't dislike mega churches. There's some I have no nothing to do with because they don't bother teaching the gospel. They're just there for the money. The more people that show up, the more ties they get. They pack their pockets. And that's their, their motivation. And you can tell because you can hear it in their sermons. You can hear it when they're begging for money. Okay. Oh yeah, we're you yeah, know want this ministry to continue, just give until it hurts and that kind of thing. And it's like, no. But there are other mega churches that are actually really, really good. Like this one. According to definition, this first church has now become a mega church. It's over 2,000 in, in, in membership. And there were no gimmicks. It was brought about through the power of the Spirit and the teaching of the Word, teaching the true gospel. That's how it happened. Okay? And I'm critical of methods that take away from those two things, the workings of the Spirit and the teaching of the gospel. Okay? I attended one mega church, to be honest. It was Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside when it was only 15,000. Okay? And the pastor taught the word. I mean, great glory. If you've ever heard any of his sermons, he doesn't pull any punches. He does not compromise when preaching the gospel. I will say that. But... Other churches, they're not so honorable about it, okay? And these other churches tend to keep God out of, and Jesus out of the equation, and they want to be in the world. They are used, That's where we go back to those methods of drawing people in. We want to be in the world, not what we're supposed to be. We're in the world, but we're not of it. They want to be part of it, and that's how they think they're going to get anything. And they forget that the church of Christ has to be Christ-centered and word-centered and not ruled by the whims of the world because it's going to change over time and the church will change with it and as long as they sit there and teach the word, love the people and reach out. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go out and get them. And that's exactly what this church did. This is what the apostles did. They were at the temple. Granted, there was no, they didn't have, a, have a, uh, a facility. The temple was just the place they went to. They were still devout Jews. They still believed in the Jewish law because they hadn't gotten that far in their thinking yet. But they also knew this is where we associate with God. And so they were there also with all the rest of the Jews who didn't believe, who hadn't heard the gospel message. And boom. 3,000 from 120, and no modern megachurch can claim that in one day. Nothing like this has ever happened. 
3,000, you know, 3,000. I mean, that number just boggles me, okay, in one time. You know, yeah, I've been to Harvest Crusades. I've seen the people come down in the thousands and so forth. That was different than this. It wasn't a, a confession of faith. It was, what can we do? Help us. And that's what the church did. After that glorious sermon, the believers continued to use the temple for their place of assembly and ministry, but then they began to spread out to the different homes. Now, one thing I will say that really disturbed me about Harvest Christian Fellowship, being one of 15,000, was you had no connection to the leadership whatsoever. You could literally walk in there, hear the message, and walk out, and no one even noticed that you did so. Except maybe the people, if you sat in the same spot every Sunday, the people would recognize you. Now, they, well, we have this and we have that, but to be honest, it was kind of sad because a person could sit there week after week after week, hearing the message, but really there was no one trying to reach out to them except maybe ushers. And the ushers were trained to, if approached, to preach the gospel at that point or to refer someone to someone that could help them out. You didn't see that very much, okay? And you felt kind of disconnected. And you could see that God already here had that in mind. No, we're going to just, yeah, we're going to be at the temple. But we're going to be at people's houses too. Okay? And it was more than just making converts. They were trying to make disciples. So there's a lot of teaching going on. So they talk about the apostles' doctrine. They were teaching them, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to believe in Christ. A lot of times a person comes down, they accept the gospel, and this is big church, small church, or everyone in between. You hand up a Bible, and maybe if you're a really fancy and new believers packet, and you say, hey, go in peace, be warm and filled. And a lot of times, unless they stick around at that church, they feel totally disconnected. The early church didn't let that happen. Breaking bread, of course. That probably meant they just had their regular meals together. Now, did they have the Lord's Supper or communion, as we call it? Probably. Probably did after the end of each meal, because that's what the Lord commanded. We, you know, we only do it once a month, okay? But these guys probably did it quite often, at least every day. Bread and wine, after all, were common fare in a Jewish household, all right? The word fellowship, it more it means more than just hanging out together or being together. It means having in common and refers probably to sharing of material goods that was practiced in this early church. And we're going to talk about this in a second. No, we're not going to decide to form a commune and buy a few hundred acres out here on Poverty Flats and set up our own compound. That's not what we're talking about here. It was that time where you sat down and got to know people. 3,000 is a large number. So the homes just like our own home group. They get together and they start talking. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm Joseph. Who are you? Well, I'm, uh, I'm Judas. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Judas. And you're brand new here. Yeah, I heard the message and I, I want to give my life to Christ. Well, let's pray. And, and let me tell you more about what we do here. And they're having dinner together. This is something that, you know, if we had the resources, it would be fun to do on a regular basis, just have... Uh, a koinonia type feast just everybody brings food in we just all sit down we we pray together we f eat together we fellowship together we have a great time together you know you, we could do potluck but you know just that that wonderful communion with other believers and just knowing that oh man yeah it's so good to feel family we hear that so much i love the feeling of family here and we're not the only church that does it Okay? I hear that from a lot of churches. And that's great. That's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, If you're going to have that many believers, you need to get it down to the grassroots level. Now, this whole thing about communal living, okay, everybody sharing their possessions and so forth, there, there is a cultural thing going on here. Uh, Acts implies that even though overt persecution is going to come later, where they're actually being persecuted, arrested, even killed, there at this point was a penalty for turning your back on your Jewish faith. Because remember, right now, this is just Jewish. 
okay? And those of us who grew up in this valley know what that penalty is because it's the same thing. You leave your church or you leave your religion and suddenly you're an unperson, okay? Your family even will wash their hands of you. But even the Jews back then, they would hold a mock funeral for a Jewish person who converted to Christianity. So a lot of these guys were out of work. They may have been kicked out of their homes. And so there were certain instances where people who had a lot says, hey, yeah, we've got space. Come and live with us. Okay. No, you're not a deadbeat. You're not in the basement playing video games. You're a person who needs help because, hey, you've given all to be a follower of Christ. We're going to help you out because we are part of the church. So this communal lifestyle mentioned in verses 44 and 45 is a response to these pressures, what had been happening. Okay? It wasn't welfare, though it kind of acted that way. It was the church taking care of its own. Be terribly honest, a lesson we need to learn from the LDS. That same thing. We need to take care of our own. Now we do. Within our resources, when we have someone who's sick, we take food over there. We take, uh, you know, we call them, check on, make sure everything's okay. Not just us, but other fellowships as well. And we help out, which is fine. That's the way it's supposed to be. But no, we're not commanded to sell everything. Remember, that's how they decided they wanted to do it. But nowhere, anywhere in the scripture does it command that we have to do the same thing. Okay, this is just how they were led. All right. Now, when they're talking about possessions, okay, uh, real estate, some people sold property. We're going to actually see a little bit more of this in later chapters. Personal possessions were like goods, like your clothes and so forth. Um, this is not, by the way, a form of modern communism. I've heard that before. Actually, there's this group of people, they call it liberation theology, who basically said that Jesus was a communist and therefore we should be communists. And that was some of the justification for these guys really causing issues in a lot of Latin American countries that turn communists. You think of Cuba for one, Venezuela for another. Um, This was not intended to be that way. It was just a temporary program. It was voluntary and... It was motivated by the what was happening at the time. And it continued on, by the way. When the persecution started getting worse, you actually started seeing this go away a little bit because God was scattering people. I'm going to talk about why he was scattering them at, at this point. Okay? Another characteristic we see in this church is the devotion to the apostles' teaching. Okay? To fellowship with one another, as we mentioned, breaking of bread to prayer. Um, And when we talk about devotion, the Greek word here uh, indicates a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. They were stubborn in their faith. Good thing. That's being devoted. Okay. Um, The apostles' teaching, we already kind of went through that. It was a body of material considered authoritative because it was about uh, the message about Jesus. They didn't have the Bible as we knew it at that time. What they had were the apostles who had seen Jesus, who had heard his teachings, and they were passing them on. Okay? You also had the Old Testament, where a lot of them were talking about, because we were, Jew- we're dealing with Jews now, about prophecy from the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled every single one of those prophecies. They didn't need the, Bible, the New Testament as we know it yet. Okay? Because the New Testament was alive, shall we say. You still had those 12 apostles who they knew what Jesus said. They were there. The Holy Spirit, of course, would empower them to preach powerfully from what their memories were. Okay. It wasn't until later that the gospel started being written. Of course, we'll get to that in in due time. And, of course, Paul started writing a lot of his epistles after he was converted. But they needed to hear You know, again, it goes back to you don't leave a person just with a Bible and say, be warm and filled. You have to invest in them, create relationships, and teach them the word. Okay? All of which was thought of in terms of a Christian tradition was passed on to these new believers. And there were different teachers. You started out with the 12, but I'm convinced that they taught others who were real quick on the uptake. God gave them a great gift 
of absorbing this information, and then they became teachers, and then others became teachers, and so on and so on. And that's, of course, you know, when we start seeing the structure of the church as it moves out from Jerusalem. Now, the fellowship, again, we talked about that already, uh, just that wonderful identity. Now, it, would, it doesn't tell us exactly how Christians knew one another at this point in time. Okay? For example, when you went to the temple and you wanted to find Christians, they were usually in one spot, a place called Solomon's Portico over on one side. But how did you know they were Christians? We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Maybe they wore a symbol of some sort. You know, like today we have the people wear a cross or, or a fish. I remember having the fish. It was really, really big when I was in junior high and high school. You know, everyone had a fish on their car. You know, and, you know, then people started mocking it by putting legs on the fish and t- calling it evolution. It was kind of bizarre. I don't know if you saw that or not. One thing that was, that's very interesting here that they mentioned is they had favor of all the people, okay? Not necessarily the leaders, but all the people. So it's very possible that when they gathered in the temple, other people reviewed or thought of them as, say, the synagogue of the Nazarenes, okay? And they had a place. They allowed them a place to worship and to teach in that area because they figured they were a sect of Judaism. There are quite a few of them out there. As long as they didn't teach heresy, they were more the the Jewish powers that be were more than happy to let them go. It kept people quiet. Um, But they weren't a sect of Judaism. Remember, this is a totally new religion because the laws of Judaism have been fulfilled. They don't have to worry about it anymore. They still observed the rites and customs, and they still they weren't planning on breaking with the nation or its institutions. But they held to Jesus, that he was the re- part of the redemptive program of God, and they kept it in their worship, praising Jesus as well as praising the Lord. Okay? Now, we're going to see next week that's going to not last very long. Because as soon as the Jewish leaders started hearing that name of Jesus again, uh-oh, there's going to be trouble. Okay? We'll, we'll leave that until next week when we start looking at chapter 3. Okay? So you had a church. It was unified. It was magnified. It was being multiplied. And it was a powerful testimony. And it's amazing what the Lord was doing here and how he was doing it. And now we can look at, you know, now we can apply it to today. There's a lot of contrast between today's church and the early church. Um, I think one that really stands out to me, and, you know, you can agree with me or not, the Christian church in Acts, especially right here, for them, once a week wasn't enough to meet for services, okay? They met daily. Verse 46 tells us this. They cared for one another daily. They won souls daily. Daily, You see that in, chapter, in verse 47. They searched the scriptures daily, and they increased in number daily. And for them, their faith was a day-to-day reality. It wasn't just a once-a-week routine. And it was because the risen Christ was a living reality to them, and his resurrection power was at work through the Spirit. And they could see it, they could feel it, in a way that we can now... But it's a lot harder for us. Okay? And it's a shame. It's been 2,000 years since it started. That power should not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. And yet, things change within the church. Okay? Now, there are some churches out there that have something going on every night. I think of the Brooklyn Tabernacle out in Brooklyn, New York. They've got 24-7 prayer going on. Now, there's, they don't, it's not just a group of people that stay there 24-7. They have people that come in and out. They take, take shifts and so forth. They'll go in for four hours. They'll join the prayer team, and then another group will go out and come in. But there's always prayer going on in that church 24-7, always. And every night they have some 
service of some sort, worship service, Bible study, you name it, something is going on. But they're also a very, very large church. I don't think they're quite a mega church yet, but they're pretty darn close. Okay? But they, that's, you know, we are unique because we have prayer once a week. Okay? But we're also a small church because prayer doesn't have to be taking place inside the office or here even. Okay? Those who are not there can pray at home. Or if they're on vacation, they can pray there. That's fine. Okay? But, you know, we have Bible studies as a church. We have them Sunday and Thursdays. And then the men have them on alternating Tuesdays. And the ladies are going to have them on Wednesdays. But there are, again, churches that have Bible studies every single day of the week. And there are multiple Bible studies sometimes. Give you a hint. Chuck Smith over at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, at his when he was at, before he got a lung cancer, at its height, he was teaching several times a week. Now he had they had something going on every day. He didn't teach every single one. But he taught Sunday morning, three services. Then he taught Sunday night. Then he taught, I think it was Thursday night. But he had also had a lot of assistant pastors who taught other nights. So everybody was covered. Okay? Now, some people may look, well, gee, where'd we go wrong? Well, I'm not convinced where we went wrong. That's kind of strong. Society has changed in many ways, and it, much as it pains me to admit it, some of that change has seeped into the church. Um, since I was a child, just as a personal testimony, I've watched, for example, the slow demise of Sunday night services okay, at various churches. And this is what I'm about to relate to you is a true story. One pastor who shut down Sunday night, he discontinued teaching it because, well, he felt it was lack of interest in the congregation. And it was a different sermon from Sunday mornings. Okay. For example, he'd do one thing, the two services Sunday morning, then he'd do something separate Sunday night. And yes, there was a Wednesday evening service that was something different, even more. And this was his explanation. A typical Sunday morning service had an average attendance over two services of about five to 600 people. Okay, so between, you know, if you added it all up, five to 600 people Sunday morning. But only about 40 would show up on Sunday night. And they were the most faithful and hardcore members. Okay, and yes, my wife and I were two of them. Okay, because we enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was because it wasn't so crowded. We enjoyed uh, the, the, what, he, what he taught. And he stated because of the price of running lighting and air conditioning and heating for that two or three hours of the service, and we're talking Southern California, and if you're familiar with Southern California Edison, yes, they are expensive. Okay? Compared to what we have up here, they're extremely expensive. And yes, electrical bill at a typical church, and I don't care how big it is, is not cheap where the air conditioning and all the lighting, what have you. And he figured that's not a wise expenditure of church funds. But he frankly admitted he was tired because he taught Wednesday nights. He taught two services Sunday mornings and one service Sunday night. He just wanted some time off. Now, before we condemn this poor fellow as being lazy, let's look at the differences between his church and the church described in Acts 2. First, they didn't have that financial overhead that most modern churches have. Neither do we, for that matter. Okay? The early church either met in the temple or in individual homes. And very likely the whole 3,000 probably got together in the temple at least once a week. Likely more often, but that's the only time they really ever all got together. Most homes at that time and most homes at our time would have trouble gathering 3,000 plus people, let alone 120 or even 40, so they probably meant local homes, a couple of dozen or so of each, the apostles going, circulating all through of them, so they would, everyone would get teaching at some point in time, and everyone would hear this teaching, everyone would be fed, everyone would hear what they needed to hear, and expenses, as I mentioned, well, they're not as great as they would be today, but obviously the early church didn't worry about it, you didn't hear anything, see anything in Acts about collecting a offering every every Sunday, okay? Why? 
Well, they live by the philosophy you hear me quote all the time, where God guides, God provides. And in fact, nowhere in this part of Acts does it state that the apostles had to return to their previous occupations in order to make ends meet. Nor is there any rec- recorded in any sermon there was a disguised plea for money. I mean, this is one thing. A lot of churches will condemn paid clergy, as they call it. Okay? But you don't see that condemnation in Scripture. Because, you know, remember, most of the apostles were fishermen. That's how they made their living. Nowhere in Acts do we see them going back to, to the boats. Because God provided in some way, shape, or form. Okay? Because the early believers, they gave to the church... And the leaders distributed the funds as needed. And no one got rich. You know, Peter didn't start getting designer robes and wearing rings on his fingers and, you know, slicking his hair up in a weird way or ride around in a posh stretch chariot, you know, with tinted windows and so forth. No, he was, he, the money was used for what it was need for. And yeah, it probably supplied his basic needs and the needs of his family because we know he was married. Okay. But not beyond that. Because everyone who was in need was taken care of. And we're going to see this side of the church more as we go through the book of Acts. Now this tends to lead to a second issue in most modern churches. And that is multiple teachers of the same spiritual maturity level. Which frankly we have here. But we are also a small church. Okay. Yes, I'm a teacher. Okay. Yes, Robbie's a teacher. Yes, Robert's a teacher. Okay, And at the moment, that's kind of where it stops. And I'm not saying that as a condemnation. I'm just saying it as a simple fact. There are other churches in this valley that have it even a thinner backup. I know if, something, if I have to, I can, I can depend on two other guys who can cover for me if for some reason I have to leave town on a Sunday. And I try not to. Okay, But I'll tell you right now. There are other churches in this valley that don't even have that much of a safety net. The early church didn't have to worry about it because they were focused not on just, as we said before, not on just making disciples or not just making converts, but teaching them to make disciples so they can come up and become teachers and ease the load on the leadership. Okay? And that was a beautiful thing. Um... One of the perks of a of a discipleship ministry is you don't have to worry if your church suddenly gets too big for its facilities. You've got him and a couple others. You can send them out and plant a new church, which is kind of what the intent was. Okay, and I'll use Chuck Smith as an example. A lot of the ones he brought up at Costa Mesa, names that a lot of people are familiar with, Mike McIntosh. Okay, Greg Laurie, I mentioned him, Raul Reese, Don McClure, Jeff Johnson, the list goes on. Those guys eventually went out and planted churches of their own. Some big, some bigger, some not so big. It didn't matter. But they were still teaching the word to other people, and they themselves rose disciples to help lead in these large churches and go out and plant smaller ones where they were needed. But those new disciples... Those new disciples, they were important. And this is a problem. And this is a twofold problem, guys. Um, because there, there's a couple of reasons why this is, is so. Um, one's from the top, one's from the bottom. Okay, One from the top. A lot of pastors are hesitant to delegate teaching to others, even to their assistant pastors. I have seen this in action. Okay, And there are legitimate reasons for this. Others, uh, not so honorable. Um, I knew one, uh, well, for example, you know, it is the senior pastor's responsibility to make sure that heresy doesn't leak, sneak into the church. That's, that's my job. So if I bring a teacher in, I have to make sure this guy is basically on the level. He's teaching from the Bible, and he's not going to ask you, let's open to 2 Nephi 3, 8, you know, or something along those lines. That won't happen here. And as far as I know, that will never happen at any of the evangelical churches in this valley. And the reason so, we are so careful, because this is the easiest way for it to crop in, a guest teacher that we're not familiar with. 
But I also known pastors that were a little paranoid about their own assistants because in one case, the assistant pastor was actually a better teacher than the pastor was. And as a result, he was under the senior pastor was under the impression that members of the congregation might prefer this assistant as opposed to himself. And so, no, I can't have him teach. Okay, and when an opportunity is to, to send him on, he'll boot him right out to start a church somewhere. But the thing is, he's still, now this assistant pastor is even more overloaded because he's got no one he's willing to allow to teach. On the other side, you have a lot of people who have no desire to do more than just sit in church and listen to the word to be fed. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there, you know, as they said, what happens if the sheep eat too much? You get fat sheep. And the same thing happens. If you have people who don't serve but are content to just continue to, to, to listen, they soon won't get out of their comfort zone. Okay, they're listening, they're listening, they know that, yeah, I should be serving. Yeah, I see the, and this is not happening here. So don't tell me, don't, don't think I'm condemning anybody. I'm not. But I've seen this elsewhere where you have 10, uh, 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people at the church. And there's a lot of people sitting there watching. Boy, man, that pastor, he's sitting there vacuuming the, the floors. Oh, that's a shame. Someone should do that for him. Are you going to volunteer? Well, no, because it would take a, a too much of my time. Oh, so instead of watching reruns of a love boat and vacuuming, you think it, you're doing a better thing. Well, I, I don't want to rob people of their blessing. Well, apparently, there's a lot of people in that, in that church who think the same thing because they're just sitting around looking at each other when 10% of the people are doing 90% of the work. Now, there are others who are, are not lazy, that they don't think that they're good enough. And there are times, and in the past I've done this, and we will probably do it again as we grow, but there are times I have actually had courses on expository preaching, how to preach from the Word, you know, philosophy of ministry and so forth. And the whole point behind these classes is to get people further up, the, uh, the ladder, shall we say, to a point where, okay, yeah, you can teach. Well, I'm a lousy teacher. I know, so am I. But don't let that stop you, okay? The Lord takes care of the problem when you're standing up here teaching everyone else. It's the Holy Spirit, not me, okay? Yes, it's true. I've had 30 years as a, as a science teacher under my belt, but that doesn't, that's a different thing. This is the Lord working through me, not me thinking I'm such a wonderful person. And that means anybody can teach if the Lord gives them that gift. Now, the thing is, the only way to find out is to teach you how to do it and see what happens. Okay? And you may find out, Lord, you could, you're better off than you thought you were. And also could find out, yeah, maybe you should better stay, stick with children's ministry. You know, it happens. You know, some people think they want to. And that's another one. I've also known the ones that, that they know I am the best teacher on God's green earth. I'm a legend in my own mind. I could take over a Sunday morning anytime, and it'll be wonderful, and the pastor will be so pleased to have me on staff, and yada, yada, yada. And guess what? A pastor hears all that, they're not going to raise them up. Because you have a pride issue. This is not what you should be doing. I mean, it's funny. You hear me tell a lot of stories about uh, Costa Mesa. And here's another one. They had an assistant, associate pastor there. His name was Pastor Romain. And those who are familiar with Calvary Chapel are familiar with Pastor Romain. This fellow was a former Marine Corps drill instructor. Okay? And had about as much tact as a Marine Corps drill instructor. Maybe a little bit more tact than a, than a uh, crowbar. And someone would show up and they want to tell Pastor <coughs> Pastor Chuck, just how wonderful of a teacher they were. They're ready to help out on you know whatever service he wants them to teach. And Chuck would just pass them on to Romaine. And Romaine said, oh, you want to serve? Fine. Here's a rake. We need someone to rake up the leaves out on the, uh, out on the campus. 
And if that person basically looked at him, put the brake down, says, no, I'm for better for that, that was the end of the discussion. Or Maine said, sorry, you can't work here, and would send them on out. He knew how to cut people down to size. He was more interested in the ones that would come in. What can I do for the Lord? I mean, I don't know what the Lord has for me. What can I do? Well, here's a rake. Go out and rake up the campus. Okay, thanks. And out they go. They had to do that for a time. And then he'd bring them up in something a little bit more responsibility and more and more responsibility. And a lot of times those guys would make it up to assistant pastor. Quite a few of them talk about their apprenticeship under Pastor Romaine. Okay. And just give you a hint of what this guy would do. One time, there was a uh, that the facility was just built. There was a plugged up toilet in one of the bathrooms, and you had two or three of the assistant pastors kind of looking at there in their suits and everything, looking at it, and wondering, okay, who's got the plunger so we can get this going? Romaine comes in saying, "What's the holdup? What's going on?" Oh, yeah, pulls up his, his sleeve, sticks his hand in, grabs something, flushes it, then pulls the sleeve back down. Rinses his hands off and goes his merry way. Now, notice what I say. Didn't wash his hands. That was Romaine. Okay? Rough and tumble character. But he was faithful and he knew how to build disciples. Because he wanted to sift them out. I don't want people who are here who want the fame and fortune because they worked with Chuck Smith. No, he wanted people who were serving the Lord and that was their primary goal. And lastly, and this is a big difference between modern churches and early churches in many respects, the early church went to the unsaved instead of waiting for the unsaved to come to them. Okay? Peter presented his sermon in the temple, not because the temple was the meeting place of the church, but because that was where the unsaved were. Okay? A great miracle had occurred. They were asking questions. He answered them. But they didn't come to him. They were already there. He had come to them. Okay? Here's the thing is that today, and this is, again, goes back to that church, church uh, consultant, the idea is to draw the unsaved to your church. Because your church doesn't look like a church. I mentioned this last week. It looks like a shopping mall or a business park or something. And the response is, you're not going to grab them anyway because Jesus never told the church to build it and they will come no he said go and make disciples go and make disciples and that doesn't hurt to have a welcoming facility because you will have a few people who are curious wander in and if they feel welcome they'll be back but that should not be your primary goal your primary goal is outreach we've talked about this so I'm not going to belabor the point relationships with your neighbors, with the person in line at Walmart or at Lens or at Gigi's or wherever you happen to be. Somebody who's maybe, and I've done this before, saying, look, I, I, I ran out of gas and I need to get on to such and such a place. Fine. I'll fill your gas tank. Boom. Go for it. Okay. Things like that. And then they ask questions. Well, no one will do that for me. Well, the Lord Jesus told me to. Well, who's this Lord Jesus? And you proceed to tell them. You have a witness. Now, well, again, remember what we said before. It doesn't matter if we never see that person again. We don't worry if what we said actually had any impact. It's The fact is you did it. You talked about it. You shared Jesus. You were a witness for him. And it's up to him now once he drives off with his full tank of gas. Okay. Really, to be honest, most of these megachurches, unsaved just don't show up because it's still a church. Okay? It's kind of like the Harvest Crusades. You know, they tell people, bring your unsaved people in. And that's true. It is a, a non-threatening situation. It's not a church and people like hearing the music. But to be honest, most of the people who are sitting up in those stands are Christians. Which is one reason why the only reason I'll go to a crusade like that anymore is if I'm one of the counselors on field or I'm doing prayer in the background because that seat that I'm taking should be filled with an unsaved person who needs to hear that message Okay, just like we're going to have the Adams Road group here Okay, yeah, I have to be here because I'm the pastor and we all should be here to, to give support but there should be empty seats ready for any of the unsaved who need to come in 
and yeah, if the seats are full and there's an unsafe person standing at that door, guess what? Yes, I'm going to stand up and let them have my seat. Because it's more important for them to hear it than it is for me to hear it. Because I've already heard it and I've already accepted it. It takes work. Evangelism is a hard job. It takes work. And a lot of churches have gotten lazy. They want, you know, bring my work to me. You know, come, you know, boy, peel me a grape. That kind of thing. It's kind of like when I was a kid. We didn't have fancy little remote controls. If I happened to be walking by and my sister was walking TV, watching TV, she'd say, hey, could you change the channel? I was the remote. Okay. <laughs> click, click. You know, oh, just the antenna. Okay. Just the antenna, what have you. Okay. Too lazy to get up. Church shouldn't be that way. I'm not saying my sister was lazy, but at that point she was. Okay. We need to stop being lazy. We need to get out there. And we are. Okay, again, most of what I'm saying right now doesn't really apply to this church. We're still small. We're doing our best. We've had two outreaches so far, and there's more to come. And that's what the Lord has laid upon us. It's emulating, you know, emulating the early church, seeing what they did right and taking lessons from it. It's not that difficult, but it is a lot of work. I will say that. We have to really allow the Holy Spirit to work through us in his way, to guide us in all our ways, and to teach the gospel of Christ to everyone. All right? Make those relationships. Plant the seeds of the gospel. Invite those people to church. If they don't show up, well, that's on them. But invite them nonetheless. Love them. Encourage for them. Encourage them. Pray for them. And then we'll be doing what the early church does. And, of course, get together for meals every now and then, at least once a week on Thursday nights. Father, we thank you again for this time we've had together. We ask you to use us as you use the early church. No, I don't expect to three, see 3,000 people come into our ranks within one day, but you're capable of doing it, Father. We're not going to say that it's impossible, but we also aren't going to sit there and expect it because we are so wonderful. Because, Father, we're just a little plant. We are what you placed here, Father. You're using us in the way you want to use us. And if it means slow growth and just reaching out one soul at a time, then so be it, Father. Because each one of those souls is important to you. It's not about numbers. You want every, you, you don't want anyone to perish. You, all, you want all to come to repentance. But Father, use us for that goal. And Father, we praise you that you have allowed us to serve you in this way. Give us the heart of the early church, the heart of love, the heart of koinonia, of fellowship, the heart of teaching, Father, the heart of prayer. And we've made prayer one of our priorities, Father, and I ask you to just continue to bless that. Again, Father, we ask you to be with those who are in here tonight because of illness. Be, Father, just give them comfort and peace and bring them back to us soon. We praise you for the, the fast uh, recovery of those who have recovered and those that are still recovering. And we thank you, Father, that we are here tonight. Give us traveling mercies as we head on home. Be, uh, keep us safe as we break down today and have fellowship with one another. But most of all, Father, keep your spirit upon us in, in our lives, in our mouths, in our hearts. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.